What is it that beckons us to the wilds of the earth? Is it to escape the chaotic hustle of our daily lives? Or do we carry a primal need to be with nature? But are we aware of all the dangers that await us in the shadows of the wilderness? Are we ignorant to the malevolent forces watching us from afar, waiting for a chance to act upon their monstrously gruesome desires? It's 2005. Damien, an EMT in his late 20s, was planning a backpacking trip with his girlfriend, Simone. She was an ER nurse and had met Damien on the job. They'd been dating for over a year, and having been on trips with other couples, they thought it was time to experience it on their own. Tired of the overcrowded trails they were used to, Damien asked some of the more traveled backpackers he had met if they knew of any more secluded areas. They told him about the Uinta Highline Trail in Utah. They explained how beautiful it was, and that people who go at the right time rarely see other hikers. Being California natives, they were both excited to hike somewhere out of state, and were looking forward to the seclusion and privacy. The Uinta Highline Trail is 104 miles of spacious alpine scenery, with hundreds of lakes strewn across its glacial basins. It's located in the Uintas Mountains in the Ashley National Forest. The trail can be more challenging in places, making it less likely for beginners to be seen there. Damien and Simone plan to hike a portion of the trail, then turn around and loop back to the start. They expected it to take five to six days, depending on how long they decided to stay in any one camp area. On the drive from California to Utah, Damien expressed how he had nothing but good feelings about the trip, but Simone was slightly concerned. Even though they were both knowledgeable and skillful hikers, she was worried they could get lost as many portions of the path were not marked trails. She thought it would be easier for them to lose their way in the bush. Damien did his best to reassure her that they were fully prepared for whatever lies ahead of them, and for a while, it worked. After a long and arduous drive, they arrived in northeastern Utah and found a hotel. They only met two other groups of hikers while in town, proving they wouldn't see many on the trail. It was early September, and the weather was already getting quite a bit colder, keeping the number of other hikers down further, but also adding to the threat of early season snow. That night in the hotel was quiet and peaceful, as they were both so hopeful for their first solo trip together. They woke up the next day, both gleeful about the experience to come, and decided to take advantage of this emboldening energy by starting the trek as early as possible. They hoped to get as far as they could on their first day. They arrived at the lot for the trailhead, spotting only one other car parked there. After double checking and equipping all of their gear, they headed out onto the dirt path. The majority of the first day was spent walking through the forest, but they made great time and took minimal breaks in hopes of reaching a pleasant spot to camp. Damien regaled Simone with his annoyingly unfunny jokes that only she found entertaining. They both enjoyed the shades of yellow, orange, and red that shone like fire when the sun glowed through the leaves. They still hadn't seen a single other person and wondered if they even would. Damien felt as if the day passed by too fast, for almost as soon as they exited the forest, the sun began to fall. The cold air meant no bugs, but also meant losing energy faster, so they made finding a place to camp their next priority. Daylight continued to fall, and they still could not find a suitable spot. After a little over an hour, they finally came to a small clearing they thought acceptable, even though it was dark and hard to see the view around them. They both knew waiting so long to make camp was foolish but their excitement seemed to temporarily overpower their better judgment. From what they could see, the area was decently wide, open, and clear of rocks. Setting up proved to be a bit challenging in the dark, but was eventually done. They were both exhausted from the long day, but felt accomplished with the distance they had covered. Dinner was eaten, and they crawled into their sleeping bags. 
Their conversation that night was short, as they almost immediately fell asleep. Sometime later, Damien was shaken awake by Simone. He opened his eyes to see her leaned over him with a look of disconcerting distress. Damien, Damien, wake up. She whispered frantically, while looking up and back at him repeatedly. Damien struggled to focus his thoughts as Simone continued to shake him. What is that horrible sound? She asked fearfully hoping he would have an explanation. Damien finally gathered himself to hear what sounded like a high-pitched, raspy scream coming from somewhere in the distance. There was a slight breeze rustling the fabric of the tent as the pair sat in silence, waiting for the ominous sound to repeat. Simone began to say, What do you think it is? When the scream again echoed from out of the unknown darkness... Damien tried to think of an animal that would sound that way, but was vexed by the pitch and volume, as it seemed to travel from far away, but was still thunderously deafening. It was as if a person were out in the woods, bellowing into a megaphone. You know what, babe? I think it's a fox. They scream like that sometimes to attract a mate, he said, aiming to calm her worries. What he failed to mention is that mountain lions have a similar mating call, that sounds like a human screaming in agonizing terror. Thought about how all the food was secured, and how the screams seemed to come from so far away that they would be fine staying where they were. He knew there was no point in scaring Simone any further when the threat was so minimal. Simone was frightened, but knew if the danger were imminent, Damien would make some sort of plan. The ear-piercing screams eventually came to a stop, and the troubled couple began to relax again, slowly drifting back to sleep to the sounds of the wind rustling the leaves. The next morning, the young couple awoke to find the location they had chosen, in the dark the night before, was more beautiful than they had imagined. They were now at a higher elevation, and could see over the fiery-leafed trees they had traveled through. The ground was a soft, almost neon green grass, with large rocks encircling them like a natural barrier. The view from their discovered perch seemed to go on forever, gave the pair a feeling of peace and serenity they had been searching for. Able to see so much natural beauty, they decided to camp there one more night, so they could take the day to fully appreciate their new surroundings. The lovers spent the hours of daylight exploring the area, and making plans to proceed with the journey in the morning. Even though they were expecting the seclusion, they were still surprised that not a single person had crossed their path. We could just walk around here naked, since we're all alone, Simone said with a flirty smile. As far as we know, we're alone, Damien joked back while looking around, pretending to be afraid. Oh, you think that's funny, huh? Simone whispered, pulling him in tight and kissing him. The embracing partners then spent the rest of the afternoon in their tent. At the end of the day, they had their dinner and watched the sunset. They retired for the night and climbed back into their tent. The scream they heard the night before was still in Damien's thoughts as they slowly drifted off to sleep, pretended that it didn't scare him. But not knowing its true origins, he found quite unnerving. Looking down at Simone fast asleep, he pushed these ponderings to the back of his mind, telling himself he was overreacting. A short time later, he finally passed out. In the middle of the night, Damien was woken, but not by Simone this time. There were strange sounds coming from outside the tent. Something was out there. Damien's mind raced at what could be lurking in the dark. He knew there was a wide range of wildlife living around them, but this sounded big, as there was no light source emanating from outside, couldn't see any shadows or shapes. He could only hear its movement and breathing. With each of its steps, Damien could hear the grass and dirt crush beneath its heavy frame. It seemed to be walking around them with the intent of investigation. Damien thought it could be a bear by the sound of its size and heavy breaths. 
They were less likely to be in that area, but it was possible. Then the idea of it being a mountain lion sent an ice-cold chill traveling through his neck and down his spine. The raspy, high-pitched scream came floating back to the surface of his mind. He could feel his pulse accelerate, his quiet panting shorten. Damien was listening with all his focus, while maintaining silence when he felt Simone begin to stir. She started to let out a light moan when Damien covered her mouth with his hand. She opened her eyes to see Damien hovering over her, with his finger up to his lips, letting her know to stay silent. She looked back at him with confused and fearful eyes. Then she heard the crunching footsteps wandering around their camp. Too afraid to sit up, she grabbed Damien's hand and squeezed as tight as she could. Damien could feel her hand shaking and squeezed back. They sat in their fabric prison for almost an hour, while the mysterious figure creeped around them, heaving loudly. It sounded like it was out of breath from excitement. This backed up Damien's previous horrid notion that it could be a mountain lion, thrilled by the possibility of a fresh kill. The footsteps moved up to the side of the tent one more time, and the terrified couple could hear breathing right up against the thin material the force of each exhale pushing the fabric inward. A terrified twosome sat, suspended in fearful anticipation, as the intensity built with every second. Simone again squeezed Damien's hand and glared at him, her eyes filled with helpless dread. Damien did his best to seem calm, though he was sure she could feel him shaking as well. At last, the steps were heard moving away from their tent, and off into the distance. The shock from the unnerving event kept them from moving an inch for some time, until they felt safe enough to slowly change positions. Not hearing any of the sounds for a while, they began to whisper about what it possibly could have been. Damien divulged his theory of a mountain lion, which made Simone even more frightened. He assured her it was gone, even though he had no idea what it was, let alone if it was still in the area. They stayed in the tent all night, too afraid to look outside or make noise. They tried to get some sleep, but were only able to get maybe an hour more of restless slumber. As soon as the sun began to rise, the anxious couple cautiously exited the tent and set about packing up all their equipment. They saw only a few feet away from the tent entrance, froze them in place once more. It was a grouping of small rocks spelling out the word, hi. Staring at the greeting and having no clue what to do, Simone looked at Damien and begged, can we please go home now? Yes, babe, we're going home. They finished packing all while checking the site for any other signs of someone creeping around their camp. Unable to find any, they decided to turn around and head back to the car. Ending the trip early was hard for them both, but fear can be a powerful motivator. The once boisterous, bubbly couple were now intimidated into traveling in observant silence. The thought of someone crawling around their camp in the dark and taking the time to leave a sinister salutation left them both shocked and petrified. Even the trees that were beautiful and calming before had become threatening and anxiety-inducing. The trip was long, but with terror as an incentive, they made excellent time. When finally arriving at the car, they were met with broken glass and an empty vehicle. Someone had smashed the windows and stolen everything out of the car, including the registration with his home address on it. Damien was sure the theft and the late night visitor were connected. They called the authorities and filed a report, but no further information was obtained. The drive back to California was long and quiet after a fight about how Simone refused to stay at their apartment anymore. She reasoned that whoever broke into their car, be it the trail stalker or not, knew where they live now. Damien argued as to why someone would follow them across state lines, 
but Simone refused to budge. Upon their return home, she packed up some things and left to stay with family until they could figure out what to do. Though he received no unwelcome visitors while staying there alone, he is aware that doesn't mean something or someone wasn't watching him. A short time later, Damien gave in and they found a new apartment. What was that horrible scream heard on their first night? Could it have been an animal calling out for a mate? Or maybe even in distress? Could it have been someone setting the stage for their frightening appearance? Using fear to manipulate and terrorize their unwilling audience? Who or what menacingly stomped through their camp? Was someone playing a sick joke? Or was there ill intent? Looking into the past of the Uintas Mountains led us to a fascinating, legend-filled story, including secret gold mines, murderous conspiracies, and nightmare-fueling cryptids. According to the native Utah inhabitants, the Utes, the high Uintas Mountains, including its rivers and lakes, are sacred. It was a place of healing where shamans brought the sick to be blessed and healed. In the 18th century, Spanish friars would travel through the Uintas in search of a path from Santa Fe, New Mexico to the missions of Monterey, California. Soon after, Spanish traders would bring into being a trade system with the Ute and Navajo living there. The fur trade would become one of the Uintas' most fruitful enterprises, but not the only profitable venture. The exchange of material goods for human life had become commonplace. Though the natives were the ones being sold into slavery, it wasn't just the new occupants supplying them. There were instances where groups of Utes and Navajos would raid other tribes, take their women and children prisoner, and later sell them to Spanish and Mexican traders. The barter and sale of individuals, as if they were livestock, had become so widespread, even local destitute families would sell their children into servitude for food to keep from starving. In 1865, the natives were relegated to the Uinta Valley Reserve Indian Reservation. Under the agreement, the American government would establish farms and pay annual allowances to the tribes. Unsurprisingly, the U.S. would fail to honor these promises. This caused the several bands of Ute tribes being forced to cohabitate, to leave the reservation and revolt in the Black Hawk War. After two years of fighting, a treaty was signed forcing the natives back to the reservation. However, in 1905, the government opened the land to purchase by any person, which brought about a flood of miners and farmers to the area. This led to increased tensions between the Utah natives and the white Mormon settlers. There are many legends of secret gold mines in the mountains of Uinta. Some tell of gold-lined caves only known by the indigenous locals, while others speak of Mormons or Spaniards mining the precious metal in still undiscovered places. Though there is no record of any substantial gold ever being found there, we have to wonder why anyone would divulge the location of their own private sources of riches to anyone, let alone the government. Many believe the power of the Mormon church in the area is due to a clandestine agreement between them and the natives that began long ago. One theory goes that the church made a pact with them to trade their gold for the secrecy of the native tribes still living in the mountains unknown to the world around them. Could they still be honoring this contract of confidentiality? One cautionary tale tells of two soldiers who stumbled across a tribe of Utes adorned in precious metals. They surveyed the area and stumbled across one of these concealed mines. The men took some of the gold to show possible mining investors, but were stopped by the native tribe. They were stripped of the gold, set free, but told to never return. Being greedy and foolish men, they went about their plan. When they found that investors were hard to convince without proof, they ventured back to the Uintas Mountains. The men were able to find the mine without any problems, but were met there by the Ute tribe. The prospective thieves were immediately executed. 
their corpses were thrown into the mine, which was then sealed. Afterward, the tribe fled the area in order to keep their existence unknown. Another tale tells of a Mexican family who had found what they thought to be an unclaimed mine and began excavating. One of the women had left the site to trade some of the gold, but upon her return was met with the scene of a massacre. Her entire family was gone, but the camp looked to be drenched in blood. Who or whatever had violently cleared the camp, also sealed up the mine, but left no trace of their identity. Could there be forces still thriving in those mountains today, protecting the native people's inheritance as brutally as possible? With an abundance of mysterious history and the ever-present danger in the mountains, they were sure to gain legends of an otherworldly and supernatural nature. Or could it be paranormal beings and events that caused the area to be so dangerous? Accounts of ghosts, long extinct beasts, unknown creatures, and extraterrestrial appearances aren't uncommon for the Uinta Basin. The sightings and happenings on the famous nearby properties of Skinwalker and Blind Frog Ranch serve as a testament to the frightening and unexplainable narratives of doubted witnesses. Cattle mutilations, alien crafts, mythical creatures, and colossal beasts crawling through portals from other worlds are only some of the experiences documented on these lands. Spirits of numerous backgrounds and temperaments are seen and heard along the Highline Trail. There are accounts of drums bellowing from the dark, and ghostly natives have been seen roaming through their once sacred land. The apparitions of hikers and campers who have lost their lives, calling out for help, are a common, chilling sight. There's the crying child drenched in lake water, who begs for help until she lets out a horrid scream and dissipates back into nothing. Could there be something keeping the essence of these poor souls from leaving, holding them in a repeated pattern of pain and suffering? Strange creatures are another frequently noted feature. One report from the early 2000s speaks of a man hiking along the trail when he saw what looked like a large wolf in the distance. He froze in place, waiting for the creature to make a move. It turned its head to meet eyes with the man, then turned straight towards him in a full sprint. The man could not move and believed this to be his last moment alive. The closer it got to him, the more he noticed its massive size. Which would have been impossible for a wolf, the man thought. Just as the beast reached him, at the last second, it turned slightly and sprinted past him, veering off the trail and disappearing. The man reported the experience to the authorities, and was shown a catalogue of wolf species to identify what he had seen. Only one picture matched his description. It was an image of a dire wolf, a giant ancestor of the present-day wolf that went extinct over a thousand years ago. A variety of sightings of a massive wolf-like creature have been reported, leading some to believe it to be the mythical Navajo skinwalker, an evil witch with the ability to control or mutate into an animal. The Navajo people refuse to share information on the subject, giving into the thought that even discussing the murderous sorcerer can summon its presence. Many others have caught sight of the elusive beast known as Bigfoot, wandering the mountains and lakes, but have been unable to obtain conclusive evidence of its existence. Wildlife experts believe it to be the perpetuation of myths or the misidentification of animals, such as black bears, but some are open to the possibility of the hairy beast. One better known Bigfoot investigator was approached by a forest ranger during a Sasquatch research trip and informed of the troubling amount of missing people in all national parks. There are staggering numbers of people found dead or never found at all in the national parks every year. What is happening to these disappearing individuals? Is it just the natural dangers of the wild that is pulling them from existence? Or is it something much more menacing? After a deep analysis of the parks and the systems that operate them, David Politis, a former detective, 
creating Missing 411, a line of books turned docuseries. He postulates the vanishings of these unfortunate persons from U.S. national parks are of a mysterious, conspiratorial variety. Politis also proposes that the National Park Service, along with other government agencies, are thwarting any investigation by outside sources. Though the evidence were fed would have us presume the deaths and disappearances are of more natural causes, the possibility of supernatural intervention and government interference is thought-provoking. Could the U.S. government really be keeping information from the public about otherworldly phenomenon causing the disappearances and demise of innocent backpackers? Maybe they're concealing the presence of serial killers living in the wilderness, tracking, killing, and burying their victims without any fuss. Are there UFOs visiting the Uinta Basin, abducting people and never returning them? Is it possible the Mormon Church could be in possession of or have an agreement with those who possess concealed gold mines somewhere in the Uinta Mountains? Maybe others have discovered gold there and are now protecting their great financial gain by any means necessary. Are the spirits of severely maltreated natives, ill-prepared travelers, or murderous individuals trapped there, haunting the Alpine trails, taking vengeance on hikers unfortunate enough to cross their paths? Is it feasible there are undiscovered beasts prowling the glacier basin, ancient mythical creatures feared by the indigenous people, that now hunt the invaders of the once hallowed mountains? As far as we currently understand, possibilities of what awaits us in the remote, unrestrained wilds of the earth are terrifyingly endless. Will you be prepared for what comes out of the shadows to take you away? Or will you be another statistic among the countless others, mysteriously swallowed by the untamed and treacherous darkness? What lurks in the darkness just beyond our view? Have you caught a glimpse of a malevolent force? Let us tell your story. Subscribe to Black Letters for a new horror story every 13 days.